My name is Jaime Garzón. I'm a PhD student uh, in the agronomy department at the University of Florida, and I am advised by Dr. Joao Ramini. Uh, first of all, I want to thank you all for being here assisting this on a highlight this month, and of course, for assist my presentation that is named Ecosystem Services of Overseeding Ashinomene Legume, in this case, into Bahia Grass Pastures in Florida. So, to introduce this topic, okay, to introduce this topic, one of the main objectives in an agricultural production is to produce more. When we directed this to a beef grazing production, that usually means to have more animals per area or a higher daily gain weight. Uh, to achieve these objectives from the Green Revolution, we had the possibility to use chemical fertilizers in, into the grasslands because with that increase of nutrients, uh, tropical grasses as Bermuda grass, Bahia grass or Limpo grass will increase the herbage accumulation and the nutritive value, achieving in, in an easier way do these previous objectives. The problem now is the increase in the fertilizers costs. As we can see here in this figure from the University of Illinois, the demand of the prices of the fertilizers have increased year after year and of course month after month. So by applying the same amount of fertilizers in previous years, uh, if we apply that same amount now, we will have less profit. One option that we have to fulfill this input of nutrients and these previous objectives is the implementation of legumes into the grasslands. This is not a new topic, actually has been studied from many years ago, but usually those research was centered in the productive variables. That means for us yield and nutritive value. And nowadays we know that those uh, variables, those responses, are inside the provisioning category of all the ecosystem services that the grasslands and the legumes can provide to our system. And of course, now we have other methodologies and other tools to measure other services that the legumes can provide to us, as happened with the nitrogen fixation and limited decomposition in the supporting category, the greenhouse gas emissions and genetic diversity in the regulating category, and finally, in the cultural category, responses as photography, aesthetics, or even human, human well-being. So now to center this to the South Florida region, here we have the Ashinomenia americana. This is a warm season legume that is native from the southern United States. We can find that in, in the field naturally in Florida, Georgia, Alabama, and Louisiana. And usually in nature, this legume is a sub shrub that can reach one to two meters height. But in a productive way, it's only used in the south of Florida and in some regions of Louisiana. It prefers humid and light acidic to neutral soils. That means that in the field, you will find that in, in shallows or in wet soils. And it, and it is annual. That means that we are depending on the residing capacity of this legume to have a good persistence year after year. And other names that we could uh, know this legume is joint veg, deer veg, or shy leaf. And because it's, an, it's work from warm seasons, it usually grows starting in April, March until October, in where it starts to bloom and produce seeds for the next year. As I said before, uh, the, the studies with this legume is not something new. Here, I, I put three examples that we have for, of previous studies working with Ashinomene. The first one is, was a study performed with only Ashinomene by Ms. Levy and collaborators in 1981. The second one was a mixture between Ashinomene plus Limpograss. In this case, it was Solenberger and collaborators in 1987, and this experiment was performed in Gainesville. 
And finally, the Ashinomene plus Bahiagras the experiment that was performed in 1983. And this one are the same with the first one, the Miss Levy experiment. Both experiments was perform were performed in the Ranch Cattle Research and Education Center at ONA. So looking at the results in the first experiment with only Ashinomene, we could see that the legume by itself will accumulate approximately 2.1 to 2.6 tons of dry matter per hectare per year, with a good amount of crude protein going to 15 to 20%, and also a good digestibility. When we measure these variables, but now including the Ashinomene into a grass pasture, the responses will change a little, because here in the second experiment with the Ashinomene plus limpograss, we could see an increase in the forage accumulation but a decrease in the crude protein. Uh, in this case, of course, the increase was due to the limpograss, but also if we compare, because they did that as well in the experiment, they also look at how much crude protein the limpograss was offering to the system by itself. And in that case, what only 4%. So actually, when, we well, when they included the Ashinomene, the crude protein concentration increases from 4 to 8 percent. Similar situation happened with the Ashinomene and Bahia grass because in here we have also an increase in forest accumulation due to the Bahia grass, of course, and also an increase from 7 percent of crude protein by only Bahia grass to 9.6 in the, in the plots with the association, and increase also in the digestibility from 41 to 46.4% of digestibility. So knowing this, uh, the idea that we have from, my, from our experiment of, that is part of my dissertation, dissertation thesis was to quantify the effect of Ashinomene overseeding and nitrogen fertilization on forage characteristics, nitrogen fixation, and nitrous oxide emissions in Bahia grass pastures. Uh, in my dissertation, we are measuring other ecosystem services, uh, but uh, for the presentation, I will focus on these two, besides the forest characteristics. This experiment was performed in the Ranch Cattle Research and Education Center located at ONA in Florida, in the South Florida. And the experimental period was from April 2019 to October 2021. The idea was to perform this experiment in two years, and for that we chose as well two different areas to try to avoid that accumulative effect and also to check differences between years. Uh, in this case, of course, to maintain like the, the differences between treatments, we look at from areas that have similar characteristics, and we found two areas uh, both, both are Pomona fine sand soil series with a low pH, low uh, concentration of phosphorus, medium concentration of potassium and magnesium, and high concentration of calcium. To imagine the experimental design in this experiment, uh, in each, each year, in each area, we have a very big uh, area of established Bahia grass. Actually, those Bahia grass was established like 15 years ago. Inside that area, we imagine the plots that we will deploy it. And with that, we randomly select those that will that have the Ashinomene overseeding. So in this point, we have some plots with only Bahia grass and other plots with Bahia grass plus Ashinomene. And finally, the nitrogen fertilization was another important treatment in our experiment. To install that in the plots, we divided all the plots in half, and we uh, randomly select those spaces that will have the nitrogen fertilization. At the end, in summary, we have four experiments, four treatments, sorry. The first one is, was Bahia grass alone, the second grass, Bahia grass plus nitrogen fertilization, the third, Bahia grass plus Ashinomene, and the fourth, Bahia grass plus Ashinomene and nitrogen fertilization. We use 10 kilograms per hectare of inoculated seed of Ashinomene, 
and we also performed an overall fertilization with lime, phosphorus, and potassium. This with, with the idea to improve the establishment of the legume. And of course, we have our treatment with 60 kilograms of nitrogen per hectare. Now, to see the results, the first one was the forest accumulation. To measure this variable, we performed our first harvest two months after the seeding of the achinomenium. Uh, after that, we, uh, we performed the uh, clipping at 15 centimeters of a stable height, and that was the value corresponding to July. After that harvest, we applied the nitrogen fertilization, the nitrogen fertilizer. We waited 35 days, and we did again the harvest. And we repeat this process in September and October. As we can see here in the figure on the left, the forage accumulation was affected per month, per the harvest time, because in August, we could see an increase in the forage accumulation. And that was probably due to the nitrogen fertilization that happened in July. And of course, in, in the graph on the, left, on the right, we are seeing that the fertilization has an effect in, in this variable, because those plots that were, that were fertilized produced approximately 200 kilograms of dry matter per hectare in comparison to those without the fertilization. And when we calculated the annual forest accumulation, the accumulated one, we could see that the plots with nitrogen fertilization produced 800 kilograms of dry matter more than those without the nitrogen fertilization. Now, see, uh, uh, this first variable, this first figure, was showing the overall forage accumulation. But now we are seeing here how was the achinomene behavior, the achinomene proportion in that same time. And in here, we could see that the tendency that we have uh, across the months was different, as happened with the whole plots, including the Bahia grass. In this case, we saw, we saw that July and August, it has a little increase, but was not much. But after that second harvest, in, at the end of August, we could see that the growth in September was much higher. That happened before. And that also increased a little more in October. Uh, the explanation for this is because Ashinomene, as a legume, usually has vertical growth. At the moment when we cut that uh, top of the, of the plant, we are stimulating the lateral growth of, the, of this plant. And with that, we are increasing the number of stems and the number of leaves per plant. So actually, this will affect as well the herbage accumulation with the only Ashinomene. In result, Ashinomene produced 311 kilograms of dry matter per hectare per year, regardless of the nitrogen fertilization. Uh, in this case, this value was kind lower than those we looked at in previous, in previous investigations, but this could be due to characteristics in the soil and also by the competition that Bahia grass produced into the legume, especially at the second year of evaluation. Now, talking about nutritive value, first of all, we have the digestibility, and, in, and with this treatment, we could show that was, was not, this response was not affected by any of the treatments. That means that the plots maintained 47 to 50% digestibility in all in whole time. The nitrogen on the other side, in here we had two interactions. The first one, uh, looking the over, overseeing strategy in the time, and the second one, looking the nitrogen fertilization and the time. So, Looking the figure on the left, we could see that those plots with Ashinomene produced more crude protein concentration than those with only Bahia grass, and that effect increased month after month. On the other side, the nitrogen fertilization caused similar differences only the first month after the nitrogen fertilization, but after that, the effect was not consistent. And in here, the Ashinomene maintained 21% of crude protein concentration, regardless of the nitrogen fertilization. 
For the nitrogen content, now we are referring to how much kilograms of nitrogen we are having in those hectares, in those areas for harvest. And in here, we could see the, a similar tendency that we saw before in the figure of forest accumulation. Having a similar concentration of crude protein by the Ashinomene, so the, var the variability, the differences between months will be, was driven by the forest accumulation. And we could see that again in August was a higher nitrogen content and that decreased month after month. To measure the accumulated nitrogen content, that means the kilograms of nitrogen per year, we could see at the end that those plots with Bahia grass and Ashinomene produced a similar amount of, nit of nitrogen per hectare than those with only fertilization. That's it's a good news because here we are trying to compare how, how is the performance of the Bahia grass by having the fertilization or having the legume. And at least in this case, having the Ashinomene will have the same response that having the fertilization. The other, the other uh, service that we measured here was the nitrogen fixation. And with this, we could see that 83% of the Ashinomene nitrogen came from the air, was fixed by the Ashinomene. And that was not affected by nitrogen fertilization or harvest. We could see here in the finger of the left that was not variation for fertilization and for nothing. And actually that means that for that 21% of crude protein that the legume is providing, approximately 17% came from the air, was nitrogen that came from the air. And of course, when we translated that to nitrogen fixed, means nitrogen content that came from the air, we are seeing the same tendency driven by herbage accumulation. And cur curious topic here was that by measuring all this nitrogen fixation in these plots, we could detect that the Bahia grass was fixing nitrogen as well. And in this case, we could account that 62% of Bahia grass nitrogen came from the atmosphere. That means that approximately, well, first of all, the Bahia grass crude protein was approximately in 10%. So that means that 62% of that crude protein, Bahia grass fixed it from the air. And of course, when we translated that to the kilograms of nitrogen content into that area, or related also by the high forage accumulation that the Bahia grass showed, that means that Bahia grass fixed 50 kilograms of nitrogen per hectare per year. And this fixation actually makes kind of sense because that could be one, one reason why the Bahia grass is performing well with low amount of fertilizations in soils that have low amount of organic matter or nitrogen concentration as well. And finally, for the nitrous oxide emissions, this figure is showing how well the variation in, of emissions across the years. And remember that this figure is showing the average of the two years that we measured. So at the beginning on July, we could see the uh, one of the peaks that was taller but shorter than the second one. This peak was expected because this happened before, after, sorry, after the nitrogen fertilization. And that was reported by literature about the effect that the nitrogen fertilization will increase nitrous oxide emissions. However, the second peak that was longer than the first one was not expected. So due to that, we had like to look and try to find some relations between other variables to try to explain why this second peak happened. And at the end, we could relate it with the soil moisture. Uh, here we could, we could see that was an increase in the moisture of the soil approximately in the same moments that this second pit happened. And actually, uh, 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 according to the literature, when, as, when the soil moisture is going up to 60%, that will increase the nitrous oxide emissions. And if you can see inside the green rectangle, the moment when the soil have that high humidity, the second peak happened. 
Another effect that we could discover here is that if you remember with the herbaceous accumulation of Ashinomeni, on September, that huge growth happened with the Ashinomene only. So actually in this case, we, could, we maybe are seeing a combined effect with the humidity of the soil, because Ashinomene likes wet soils, and also the effect that have bigger amount of Ashinomene fixing more nitrogen to the soil. That will represent at the end more nitrous oxide emissions. So at the end, knowing that this the effect that this legume is causing, we calculated the accumulated nitrous oxide emissions per year. And in there, we could see, we could see that those plots with the association with Bahia and Anachinomene produced a similar amount of nitrous oxide per year than those with only fertilization. Finally, to conclude, we could see that according to our results, overseeing Ashinomene into Bahia grass pastures, increased crude protein concentration and causing no differences in forage yield, probably by the botanical composition. Ashinomene was effective to fix biological nitrogen and the magnitude of the fixation was driven by herbage accumulation. And finally, overseeing Ashinomene increased the same amount of nitrous oxide per year than nitrogen fertilization into Bahia grass pastures. Well, thank you very much for your attention. Uh, here you can see my email if you want to make some questions uh, after, after the on a highlight, or as Andrea said, you can type it in, into the chat and win as well as after the announcements. Thank you very much. Okay, here's the question. He, uh, the person says, hey Jaime, thank you for your presentation. I have a question. How do you analyze N from the air on the Bahia grass? Uh, this technique for analyzing nitrogen fixation and the nitrogen that came from the air, it it's related with the isotopic differences that we have from the nitrogen in the air and the nitrogen in the soil. So by, by detecting those difference between the isotopes, we can measure uh, if how much of that nitrogen that is presenting all of our sample came from the air or from the soil. Cool. Cool, okay, thank you, Jaime. That's the only question we have at this time. So while we're waiting to see if there might be more, I am gonna go ahead and switch things over so I can share just a few announcements real quick. First of all, we'd like to welcome you to join us back on April the 12th for our next Ona Highlight. That is going to be <clears throat> a special feature of the South Florida Bee Forge program and a couple of the new extension agents, Allie Williams and Sherry Trent, will be presenting collaboration, communication, and education enhancing Florida's livestock industry through the South Florida Bee Forge program. Allie is a small farms and alternative enterprises extension agent with Hillsborough County and Sherry is a 4-H and agriculture agent with the Seminole Tribe of Florida. So that is going to be the 12th of April, and they will be on site here at the Research Center to present. The next program I'd like to share is the upcoming environmental lands management um, function that's going to happen here at the center March 31st, a full day program. I'm not sure when registration ends, but it might be coming up um, fairly soon. The fee is $50, and as you can see on this flyer, there's going to be some great speakers. Meal is going to be included, as well as a tour of the center. So that'll be a great program to join if you can, and register on Eventbrite. Another great event that's going to be coming up this summer is our Youth Field Day. And we have a plan in place. Um, if you know someone that might like to come to this, take a quick screenshot or a photo of this little bit of information to share with them. We will have the flyer ready in April and registration is going to open May 1st. 
And um, as always, our goal is to excite students about agriculture and science, to reveal future opportunities in those fields, fields for them, and to foster a love of learning which will promote agriculture and good stewardship in this and future generations. And so as you see here, um, some of our sessions, the invaders, drones and science, do all grasses taste the same? Supplementation evaluation, watershed hydrology and water quality. And we're gonna have another educational expo and hoping, weather permitting, that the forestry department can be with us um, to teach a little bit about um, fire and its use in land management and to do a controlled burn, weather permitting. Also on this is a few photos from last year's Youth Field Day. If you're not already doing so, please follow us. Uh, our showing now is our website, as well as social media. You can follow us on Facebook and Twitter and YouTube. And if you don't already get our Friday email news blasts, send us an email to ona at ifis.ufl.edu to get on that email list. And each Friday, you'll get an email with upcoming events, things that have recently happened, awards, those kinds of things that we just want to share with you guys that might be beneficial to you all. So now I am going to um, close that off. And let's see, stop sharing my screen and go back and see if we have any more questions. Okay, Jaime, we have one more question. Oh, we have a few questions. All right, let me make this a little bit bigger so I can see all of them. All right, so let's see. Okay, so here's another question. Again, congratulations on your presentation. Did you measure nitrate? Yes, very good question about that because Actually, the one of the objectives of my dissertation is try to figure out how will be the cycle, not only the part of the grass on the soil, but also is trying to figure out, okay, if I am applying this nitrogen, how is going to the soil, to the plant, to the air? And yes, we measure nitro, nitrous and ammonium. And as brief summary of those results is actually there are almost non-nitrate nitrate in, in, in the soils. We have some effect with ammonium, but uh, because the characteristics of the soil uh, and because also the fertilizer that we applied was uh, nit ammonium nitrate. So actually we were expecting to have that increase in nitrate, but was only an eff was effective only the next month after the application. And after that, the nitrate apparently almost disappeared, was lixiviated probably. Okay, thank you. Um, next question. The N2O production is minimal. Why might this be? Uh, well, that is, that's, that's right. You, the, the person that is answering is right. It's because we have here soils that are very sandy and soil that also has very small amount of organic matter. That means that the amount of microbial population that can do this effect is not that high as happened with in comparison other soils in other regions. Besides, remember that the amount of nitrogen that we are applying here is a low rate of nitrogen fertilization. Actually, it was only 60 kilograms of nitrogen per year. So actually, due to that, the input was low, and for that, the output will be low as well. And finally, to add one more thing, because I am thinking now in the fixation of the legume, but of course, we need to remember that we are dealing with bahia grass. And the bahia grass is a tropical grass that is very sensitive to nitrogen. It loves nitrogen. So actually any input of nitrogen that is rich into there, it will consume it by the bahia grass. And that, will, and that resulted in the increase of herbage accumulation. Thank you, Jaime. 
All right, next question. <clears throat> Despite the fact that Ashenominy addition did not increase herbage accumulation in the hay grass pastures, would you expect that cattle in a pasture with this mixture would gain more weight? According to the nutritive value, yes. Yes, because uh, we, we could see that by applying the Ashenomene, that will mean that we are giving more available nitrogen to the cattle. And we also know that usually cattle prefers to eat leg legumes than grasses sometimes. So that's why it is important to remember as well the care that you need to have with these pastures when you have a legume in there. Because usually the cattle just going first to the legume and with that and after we'll start eating the, the, the grass. So that's why we need to control a little more the grazing height and the amount and the time that th that cattle will be in those pastures. Um, and of course, we have also previous uh, results of previous research that say that with the inclusion of the legume, it will have an increase in the daily gain weight of, with the animals. Okay, thank you. Next question. Next question. <clears throat> Great job, Great Jaime. Job, Jaime. Since you've almost Since completed you've almost all of your research, all of research on this, what is your take-home take message take from home producers? Home? More specifically, what would you, why would you recommend the practice of overseeding astronomy to producers? Obviously, for the reasons you've already mentioned, but are there others? Well, I think that I, I made kind of summary of that reasons when I presented this slide with ecosystem services, because the, the inclusion of legumes in grassland is an option that we have. Of course, as a, every other option, it has good things and bad things, something that challenges that we is, are expecting and we need to improve. But it's an option that we have, and not only because we are here affecting and try to improve the delivery of nutrients to our cattle, but also because in that way we are trying to do more resilient our system and our production on time. Now, whether we know that we that the implementation of the legume will help to make more stable the production in between years by genetic diversity and other ecosystem services that the legumes are introducing to this system. So actually it's like the main reason. Okay, thank you, Jaime. It looks like that's all the questions for today. Okay, so thank, thank, thank you, you so much for presenting. Thank you very, no, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity uh, to show a little my my dissertation to the people. And well, and of course, I'm a happy happy Women's Day to all the women that are seeing us today. <laughs>